All right, gang, picking up where we left off, talking about arrays. No bounds checking in C++. Now, if you've used Python, if you've used Java, well, if you use Java, if you try to access an element past the end of the array, like if we try to access element four, when there's really only elements zero, one, two, and three, Java will just throw an exception up and it'll crash the program, right? Unless you handle exceptions. C++ won't, and it'll just, it's happy to let you read past the end of the array. Python will also do the same thing. It will not let you read past the end of the array. So if you do, you know, if you try to create a quiz like that, in Python the syntax would look something like this, you know. And then you access an element that's past the end of the array. Well, this is, is how many long is this? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we can only access elements zero through five. So if we try to print out, you know, zero through six, it'll crash, right? In Python. Won't in this language. In this language, you don't get any errors. So you'd better use a size declaration. Wait, no. So you can use subscripts that are beyond the rounds of the array, but beyond the bounds of the array, which is why it's always a good idea to create a variable that contains the size of the array so that you can check, right? Because if this array is of size three, and then we have something for i is equal to zero, i is less than five, it's going to write past the end of the array, which won't give you an error. Might, might not. The results are going to be unpredictable. Let's go ahead and uh, get into Visual Studio and prove that to be the case. Hey, afternoon. Oh, hey, how you doing? Alrighty, so we just started. We're talking about bounds checking in your arrays. So I'm going to make a uh, new project. I think we're on T. Because last time we were on S, Q, R, S, okay, so yeah, T. All right, so let's make an let's make an array. Maybe not just an array of ints, right? Ten long, and let's initialize them to zero. So that sets the first element to zero. I forget to give it a name. That's pretty dumb. All righty, so I'm gonna just give it the real creative name of array. Why did I type care? My brain is somewhere else. Here we go. Int space array subscript 10 is equal to zero. So if we print out the data past 10, right? So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than, let's go all the way out to 20. i plus plus. Let's print out that number. C out i followed by a space followed by the array at that subscript. Followed by ENDL. Don't really need that, do we? System pause if you're on an old version of Visual Studio. Doesn't seem to be necessary anymore. Stop trying to upgrade everything. All right. What did I do wrong? Error list. Oh, using namespace. That's what I get for not do doing my boilerplate. Right, and here we go. We read in our 10 values, and then we started reading in some other stuff, and the results are unpredictable. We have no idea what kind of data that is. Now, the debug version of Microsoft Visual Studio stuck that in there, 
that's a very special key that it looks for if you're trying to write past the end of the array it usually usually will pick that up in the debugger but in regular code no let me give you an example of what I mean I'm gonna reset all those values to the number one as we go so as soon as we read it out the next thing I'm gonna do is set that value equal to one right then I can print them out again so I'm just gonna copy that loop and print them again no reason to change them the second time And it blew up, right? Runtime check failure. Stack around the variable array was corrupted. How did it know that? Because the first time that it ran, if we can find its output, I'm not sure I can. My output window. There it is. It picked up eventually that I overwrote that value. The debugger did. Not C++ itself, not the executable, but the debugger picked up that that value had changed. And so it said that it had been corrupted. I'd written past the end of memory. If I compiled it for debug mode, it probably wouldn't, excuse me, for release mode, it probably would not do that. So if I stop the debugger, and change it to compile for release, rebuild it, and run it there we go we got a hard crash right with something totally weird right fast fail stack cookie check failure whatever right so the program actually crashed and i'm surprised that it was the debugger was even able to catch you know point to a line of code that where that happened not in our code right it's just in an error handler code Set up a fake exception and report it via unhandled exception filter. We can't raise a true exception because the stack and exception handling can't be trusted after a buffer overrun. Writing past the end of the array is called a buffer overrun. The exception should appear as if it originated after the call, so it is attributed to the function. Okay, so anyways, can't really bad idea to write past or read from the end of an array. So that, mean, that reminds me of a topic, exception handling. We really haven't talked much about that yet. We've seen them. We've seen these things come up whenever we do something wrong, and we haven't done anything else. So why don't we do something else? Why don't we look at try catch examples? Hmm. I'm not finding a quick, quick, quick example to give you, so I might skip this for now. All right, well, we can make it so that we can check our own exceptions. May as well do that just so that when I use the term exceptions, it makes sense what we're doing what that means. So I'm going to make a function that divides one number by another one, right? So, and it returns the result. int divide int x by int y. Now normally you don't want to just do integer division because it rounds down, but let's just roll with it. And so I'm going to say the result is equal to x divided by y, and then I'm going to return the result. What happens if I try to call that and I divide 1 by 0. What kind of message do I get? Whoops, not result, divide. Edits were made which cannot be compiled. I guess because the debugger is still running. Go away. Alright, try it again. 
build errors. Well, for one thing, I want to switch back to doing the debug version. But I didn't know I had build errors. Two errors. Can you tell me what they are? Too few arguments in function call. Oh, one comma zero. Excuse me. The thing takes two parameters, x and y, so we better pass in two arguments, one and zero. All right, exception unhandled. We got a divide by zero and it crashed our program. Uncool. We need to fix that. So we need to enclose that in what's known as a try block. Looking this up so I get it exactly correct. So the syntax for that is to use the word try here. And let's do, let's add some code here. About to divide, C out, about to divide. And then please try this. So try curly brace. And inside the curly braces is the questionable code that could crash with an exception. And let's put C out after the divide. Backslash in, end quote, semicolon. Now when we run it, actually I meant to put this in the divide code itself, in the divide function itself. It's okay to have it here though. Let's see what happens if we, if we have it here. I'm going to stop it and run it. And I don't have a catch block, so I'm not even sure it's going to compile. Yeah, try block requires at least one handler. Okay, so let's stick a handler on it. What's a handler? It's a catch statement. What are we going to catch? We're going to try to catch a runtime error. So runtime error ampersand err. And then see out could not divide backslash in end quote semicolon. Alrighty, unhandled exception, integer division by zero. Well, it didn't do the one that I, didn't catch the one that I wanted, so I'm going to come up and just Google integer division by zero C++ catch and see the correct syntax for doing so. Division by zero doesn't throw a C++ exception. It's normally just undefined behavior. Since we're getting a floating point exception, it's not catchable via C++. Alrighty, that's disappointing, but we can check it ourselves. We can and throw an error if we find it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my divide code and I'm going to make it handle. It's going to check to see if the divisor is zero. And if it is, it's going to throw an exception. So if y is equal to zero, that's bad news. That would crash our program. So we're going to throw a runtime error math error, attempt to divide by zero, like that. And what throw means is, okay, we're going to stop our program right there. We're not going to do anything else. If we have C out here, and this is step one, and then we do C out less than less than step two here, Oops then when we're doing normal division, it's okay, right? If we divide one by one, not gonna be a problem. Nothing is gonna happen, nothing wrong. I seem to have a uh, break point here. Exception thrown. 
Oh, because I'm still reading past the end of the array, right? So we've proven that that's a terrible idea. I'm just going to comment all that code out with a slash star at the beginning and a star slash at the end. Or I could just highlight the whole shebang. And since I'm using an editor that supports it, I could do edit, advanced, comment section. Like that, right? Comments out all of that code. So it won't compile. All right, so now, I, but the fact that it got that far means that our division function worked. It divided by zero. Stale code warning. Okay, that's because I didn't stop the debugger. Seems to be pickier about that today than it. Well, I guess it's because I'm hitting exceptions. Alrighty. You ready to stop? Can I run the program? All right. And so about to divide, step one. Step one was before the check. Step two was after the check. So it went ahead and did the division and returned the result. And so when it got down here, you know, we were able to print the result. I don't know that we ever did. Oh, I guess we did right there. We printed out a one, right? I didn't make it very clear. Let's make it a little bit more clear. Like int x is equal to divide one comma one and then see out that. See out result of divide equals end quote less than less than x less than less than endio. And then I'm going to move this after divide. Well, that's okay here. And then I'm going to put the word done down here. So here's our code. Now we have a see out message that says about to divide. And then this function prints out in step one and step two. It never hits step two if there's an, a problem, right? If y is zero, then it's not going to get to step two. It's going to throw the error instead. And when the error is thrown, it's going to be caught by this, meaning that it won't do this. And it won't do this because the divide statement generated an error in the try block. And as soon as the error was, en was encountered, since it's in a try bo block, it looks for a catch that matches it. And since the error thrown was a runtime error, that's what it is. Catches it right there and it goes here. So once we change this to divide by zero, we're going to see these messages about to divide. And then it's going to go into the divide function, one zero. And it's going to come up here and it's going to print step one. And then it's going to check that. And that's going to be true. So it's going to throw the error. So it's not going to print step two. It's not going to come back out here and print out the result of the divide and after the divide. It's going to go immediately to here and print could not divide. Or I probably could print the error message out itself instead. Well, let's see what happens if I do that. If I see ER, I mean, see out ERR. Let's see what that looks like. Now, what are you complaining about? So it's going to go away as soon as I compile? Nope. All right. Well, it's not a string. Can we get a string out of it? ERR dot what? ERR dot what parentheses in parentheses that'll get that message out all righty and so this time it worked right result of divide is equal to one let's change it to divide by zero right there all right so step one, it did not get to step two because the if statement caught it and threw the error. And so the catch statement caught that error and printed out the message of the error, which was math error attempt to divide by zero. So C++ is not as good about handling exceptions as some things are because if the operating system is throwing the exceptions, there's no guarantee that it'll be able to capture them just like that divide by zero exception. 
and we weren't able to capture that so we had to check it and throw our own error as a result but that's okay you'll see exception handling used an awful lot and so i should have introduced it earlier in the semester even though it wasn't in the powerpoints so back to where we were in the powerpoints Better not access elements negative 1 or negative 2 or access elements 3 or 4 if the array only supports 0, 1, and 2. Be careful not to use invalid subscripts. Doing so can corrupt other memory locations, crash a program, or even lock up the computer. Also cause elusive bugs. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't. Indeterminate behavior. Off by 1 errors is when you use array subscripts that are off by 1. If you start your subscripts at 1 rather than 0, right if we're looking at this and this is subscript 0 1 and 2 maybe we're used to counting on our fingers and so we try to access elements 1 and 2 and 3 well that's a problem isn't it it's a problem because we skipped that one and we went right past it and we should have uh, should not access that one so the range based for loop you may have seen this syntax in other languages but we've seen two kinds of for loops. I just showed you one in the code that was going past the end of the array here. But you can print out an array like this as well. So for int value colon array, for every integer value in the array, see out that value. Why doesn't it like the word array? I should not be using the word array because it's also in the name of a class. So I should not have chosen that as my variable name. But since I did, I guess I'll run, leave it like that. Okay. So let's store some values in it. You know, 1, 2, 3, 6, 9. Right. And then the rest of it will be padded out with zeros. So this fourth statement. Let it go. And there it goes, right? It printed out a 1 and a 2 and a 3 and a 6 and a 9 and the rest of them are zeros. Notice we don't have an index, right? We don't have an I. We can't put print its position in the screen. Well, that's okay. How many times do we really want to print those numbers anyways? How many times do we want to print 0 through 9? Usually you just care about the data. So this is a fast way to step through the data. However, does not work inside, outside of the context in which the array was declared. If I come up here and I write a function called print array that takes an array of ints like that, and we try to do the same thing. So for every int value in that array, see out that value all by ndo it's going to complain this range based for statement requires a suitable begin function and none was found well rather than go dig what that means i'm just going to say that if you pass an array into a function you cannot step through it like that are there any ways around that have we found ways around that well at one point we were talking about passing things in by reference. Can we do that? Can we pass our array in as a reference? An array of reference is not found, uh, not allowed. I really thought it was. I was actually expecting that to work. Reference to array in C++. Well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's too bad. How about if it was a pointer? Remember, we talked about a pointers being a way to pass something in by their address. And it's not going to really work. With a pointer, you know, I could put a P in front of it to indicate that it was a pointer. And then when I was ready to actually access it, I would, you know, need to do star P array to dereference it. And it's going to complain about that too begins a suitable 
it requires a suitable begin function and none was found. Okay, so so far I have not found a way of passing in to a function an array in such a way that the range-based for loop, the what what other what's often called a for next loop, or excuse me, a for each loop, rather than for next, it's a for each loop, right? Doesn't work. So how can we fix that? Same way we do it every other time. You pass in the size as a variable, right? Now I'm going to undo all this pointer stuff because it didn't work. And we can't do it like that anymore. We just have to do, in fact, we have to rewrite the whole thing. This is going to look like other loops. Start at zero, keep going while we're less than the size, I plus plus, and then we can see it out. put commas between them rather than spaces I mean character turns and when we're done with it we can print out a backslash in so when I'm ready to print out my array if I want to call that function it's easy enough to do right print array I have to pass in the size of the array excuse me the array itself but I also have to pass in the size now the size of the array happens to be 10 but I know that, and it's just cheating for me to fill that in by, quote, knowing it. And we talked about several different ways of handling that. One is that when you define your array, you ought to define a variable that is the size of it, right? Const int size equals 10. That's one way you could do it. And then put the size variable there. And then put the size variable down here. But when you can use a range-based for loop, when you can use a for each loop, the syntax is awfully nice, right? That is cleaner syntax than that. Maybe it's not that much cleaner, right? If we were to write it the other way, for int i is equal to zero, i is less than size i plus plus, maybe I'm overselling it, right? Array subscript i, subscript endl. I guess it's not that much worse. It's a little bit cleaner. So that was introduced in 2011. The C and C++ has been around a long time since the 80s, so it's a relatively new feature. Provides a specialized version of the for loop that, in many circumstances, simplifies array processing. And they put it in C++ because it was already showing up in Java and Python and stuff like that. It iterates once for every element in the loop. Each time the loop iterates, it copies an element from the array to a temporary variable known as the range variable. And that's what's happening here, right? Each element, in turn, is getting copied into this temporary variable. Now, that implies something. That implies that if it is a temporary variable, we can do anything we want to after it. Is that going to change the original array? Are we going to now have an array full of negative 999s? And the answer is not, because this is a temporary variable, right? It was created here, and it's going to disappear here, and the changes are not modifying that. Whereas, if we change it with a for index-based for loop, they absolutely would be changed. Okay, so we never saw any 999s, right? We never saw any negative 999s. But if we stuck this in the for loop instead and changed their order, so, you know, array subscript i was equal to negative 999. What are you complaining about? Oh, and it went away. Ah, all right. Anyways, change their location. This is actually changing the array as it goes through it because we are act we, we have access to the original array. We're not using a temporary variable to hold that value, so we're actually modifying the array itself. And the second time it prints it out, we're going to see all negative 999s. All right, just like that. So if you need to change the data, or if you otherwise need an index variable, 
a range-based for loop is not the way out. Not the way to go. Range-based for loop, also known as a for each loop. Some languages even have the keyword for each, and I like that. You know, for each. I like seeing that. I don't know why they didn't do that in this language. It looks nice, right? But anyways, they didn't. So why do you like it? You don't have to use an index variable. You don't have to use a counter and you don't have to worry about stepping outside the bounds of the array. And that's a biggie, isn't it? Right? We don't have to worry about this size variable. We didn't even have to declare one, right? We could have just created our array, not worried about the size, and then we could step through it with a for each loop, not have to worry about the size because it handles all that itself. Which is nice, but if you're going to pass the array to a function, you can't use a for each loop inside the function. So when you're writing it, you give the data type. In this case, it was int, but you can have an array of any data type, right? You know, doubles, floats, and whatever. You can have an array of arrays if you want. So int numbers is equal to, this is exactly like my example, right? Here's an array called numbers got some numbers in it and then for each value for every integer value in the numbers array print it out so modifying an array with a range based for loop if you want to change the value you make its temporary variable a reference variable and this doesn't work in Python and this doesn't work in Java but it works in C++. Every language behaves a little bit differently. Otherwise, you wouldn't have all these different languages. And if you really did want to make all of these negative 999 as you step through them, you could put an ampersand there. And so value is no longer a temporary variable. It's a reference to the original data. We talked about reference variables last time. right? If I do int age is equal to 33, and then I do int ampersand xyz equals age and then if I change xyz equal to 44 and then I print out age age is now going to be 44 because we changed it using its second name well it's complaining about that oh yxz excuse me xyz like that so this declares a reference to it effectively we have two names for the same memory and we can change that memory via either name we can change it through age or we can change it through XYZ so when I set XYZ equal to 44 age is now going to be 44 change that back to value because I took it out of the for loop with the integer wherever that was right there it's now back inside the for each loop but since the for each loop is defined to use a reference it can change the data so now I need to move this for loop back down underneath it to prove that the data was in fact changed whereas it had not been before so I'm going to cut that scroll down here paste it all right and there we go now we are going to see those modifications to the array, right? And as promised, age was 44, not 33. So for each loop, which is a range-based for loop, you don't need a size or a counter. It uses a temporary variable. The syntax is for data type, variable name, colon, array name. If you make var name a reference, then you can actually modify the contents of the array. 
otherwise var name is a temporary variable that contains the value of the element but changing it doesn't modify the original array copy in all caps Range-based for loops only work in the co same context, in the same function, in the same pair of braces in which the array was defined. Same is true of the size of trick. If you remember that, that's where we did int size is equal to the size of the array divided by the size of, excuse me, divided by the size of the first element in the array. Mm -hmm. Like that. Can't do that inside a function either, which is too bad. So that's why these functions just about universally require you to pass in as an argument, the maximum size of the array so it knows where to stop processing. The range-based for loop versus the regular for loop. The range-based can be used in any situation when you need to step through the elements of the array and you don't care about subscripts. But if you do need the subscript, for example, parallel arrays where you have multiple arrays that are linked by their subscript, you better use a regular for loop. Processing array contents. Array elements are the same as ordinary variables, right? If you want to add one to an element of the array, test subscript I++ will add one to that element. However, if you put the plus plus inside the variable, it adds one to I and not the element, right? Array assignment. To copy an array, you do not do this. That just creates two pointers to the same data, which is pretty easy to prove. We have that array that's all full of negative 999s, right? I'm going to make a new array pointer that points towards it, right? So int, I'm just going to call it AR2. And then I'm going to say AR2 is equal to array it's complaining it wants some kind of number there to make the error go away what are you complaining about let me guess you're going to go away as soon as i save it there were build errors is it telling me i can't make an array of length zero okay the size of an array must be greater than zero that's news to me here we go I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of stupid, trying to make an array that's greater than size zero, but you find arrays like that all the time. So anyways, and if I had done this, I wonder if it would have made an array of size zero if I'd just done that. Nah, apparently, apparently not. Okay, but it's not letting me modify, copy the array like that. What do you got to do? You got to make a new array that's the same size as the first array. And then copy the elements in by hand. So how do I do that? Well, I know the size of the array, so I can just do this, right? Whoopsie, wrong. AR2 square brace size, right? And then I copy the elements in one by one. For int i is equal to zero, i is less than size, i plus plus, and then array two at that specific element. So array two subscript i is equal to array subscript i. And now if I print array two, ar2, then I'll see a second array full of 999s. Mm. Uh, 
Oh, does not take one argument. Why? What arguments does print array need? It needs two arguments. It needs the first one, which is the array itself, but it needs another one, which is the size. And here we go, right? The second array printed out with all of its with all of its nines. That's how you copy an array. To copy an array, you create a new array with the same size of the original and then copy the elements in with a loop. Now there's probably a member of an arrays class which would do it in one step. Let's see if there's an arrays class. C++ array class. So with an array class, you get something that's a little bit more sophisticated than a regular C array. An array class does know its own size, so you don't have to always pass around the size parameter. So to create an array, you do pound sign include array. And then you create it like this with syntax. I want an array of integers and I want room for six of them and then instead of using AR subscript I you use AR dat, dot dot at I in order to get them out and if you want to use it with a for each loop I believe you can do so as well well let's play with that let's see if we can get that going I think the fact that I call this array may have been a mistake The reason why I say that is because that's our data type. So I should have chosen a better name, and I'm going to rename all those arrays to AR1, which way may make our comments really stupid, right? I'll have to go back, and I'll have to fix that at the end. But up here at the top, I'm going to do a Control-H so I can do a search replace. I'm going to replace the word array with AR1. And like I said, I know that messed up some comments. copy an array, you create an array, and then copy the elements one by one. If you make var name a reference, you can modify the contents of the array. Range-based loops only work in the same braces in which the array was defined. I think that's all of them. Okay. Alright, so let's try creating an array. I want an array of doubles and I want 10 of them. AR3 equals and I'm just going to initialize them all to zero see if it accepts that. Incomplete type is not found. Well then I did it the wrong way. It doesn't look wrong to me. I probably forgot to add the pound sign include. Scroll up here. Give ourselves a new one. And let's get string while we're at it. Pound sign include array. Pound sign include string. Hopefully that'll make this one start to work right down here. So that's demonstrate using the array class. Now we've created an array of doubles and we can step through it. Let's try a for each loop. For every double value in AR3, not sure that'll work. Let's find out. We're going to print out that value. 
followed by a colon, just for giggles, have something different printed out. Okay. And I don't see any syntax there, so I think it's going to work. Or not. You put a, up there at the boilerplate, there was a, something you missed. Ah, thanks. There we go. And there we go, right? Our new array is full of zeros. And that thing can be passed into a function. So if we make a print array that it, this, oh, for Pete's sake. I'm gonna change that back to the word print array. So control H. And replace all of that with the word print underscore array. And I'm going to write a new method with the same name that accepts the array class. You know what? I'm actually going to have to look up how to do that. Using array class in C++ as a parameter. C++ does not allow it to pass an entire array. However, you can pass a pointer to array. Yeah, I know that. But I want the array class. I'll stop pursuing it if I can't find the answer within about 45 seconds. Well, maybe it's just as easy as, as um, duplicating the syntax that we already had down there. Let's give that a shot. So print array an array of type ints, but see it wants a size. Do I have to give it a size at all? Or is that a syntax there? That's a syntax there. Okay, forget it. I'm not going to figure out how to do it. I know it's possible. I'm not going to spend our time right now doing it. But at least you can process it without having a size indicator. We, don't, we can ask that array for its size if we so need. Right, int size2 equals ar3 dot. I forget whether it's length or size. There it is, right? And then if we want to do that for int i is equal to size2 minus 1, let's, let's print out the array backwards. Keep running while i is greater than or equal to zero, i minus minus. Let's put some numbers in here so that we can see it print backwards. Like four, five, six, nine, ten, eleven. Right. And so we're gonna see out array three dot at parentheses I followed by colon end quote semicolon why did I start at size 2 minus R excuse me minus 1 because if it's 10 long the highest element we can access is 9 so I'm just initializing I to 9 and going as long as it's greater than or equal to 0 no I'm not Parentheses. It's a method. And there we go, right? 4, 5, 6, 10, 11. Okay, I forgot to do a print end of line, right? After this print statement, it was there, and then I deleted it. So, let's do that. Print out ENDL, and do the same here. All right, and so now it's backwards, right? Four, five, six, whatever. So printing the contents of the array. You can display the contents of a character array just by sending it to C out. So here's an array of a characters being treated as string. And so then we can print it out like that, but that only works as character arrays. 
Normally you have to have a for loop and we've shown, that's what we've been showing through most of the lecture. Summing and averaging them. You can use a range based for loop to print out a total. You just declare your total variable. Your for loop, oopsie, adds that value to the total each and every time. And then you can calculate the average. Finding the highest value of an array. What we need to do is to initialize a variable equal to the first value in the array and then step through the rest of the array seeing, seeing if we can find a higher value. And if we do find a higher value, then we set that value equal to that. Let's do that. Let's do it both with an index like they do here and without. I'm going to go back to just using AR1 rather than the this guy so that we don't get too in the habit of needing this dot at business so let's declare well let's do the total first so the total is zero and then for every int value that's in the array we add that to the total and what's the average double actually I like making my totals a floating point type so that when I calculate the average it won't be rounded down so double average is equal to the total divided by the size how about finding the highest value in the array int highest is equal let's just get the first value in the array right because it could be the highest we don't know if it is or not and then we have another loop for every value in the array if oh come on if that value is greater than the highest then that becomes our new highest so let's see out the total Let's see at the average. And let's see out the highest. And there they are. Well, okay. <laughs> Fine. It's because I replaced them all with 999s. I'm going to go way up here and delete that. Right? And now it'll probably be all zeros because I forget what is in, in our original data. No, nope, it doesn't have all zeros in it. I don't remember what it was. Okay, one, two, three, six, nine, right? But anyways, here it is. The total of those numbers. Why don't we print them out first before we calculate, before we do all this printing stuff. So let's call C out array values equals end quote and then let's call print underscore array and pass in ar1 along with its size and that way we'll just see the values of the array right before we print them out right looks like i put them in the wrong place down here before we finally print this stuff out that's where i wanted it and maybe even a backslash in in front of it to add ourselves a blank line
And there we go. Those are our values, and the total is 21. The average is 2.1, and the highest is 9. What about the lowest? Same business, except you're going to change this one, right? Instead of value is greater than, you're going to say value less than. So int lowest is equal to ar1 subscript 0. And then for every value in ar1, if that value is less than the lowest, make it the new lowest. And I didn't print it out, but we could. Copy and paste that, change it from highest to lowest. All right, so what if we wanted to calculate? I mean, do, you know, enter uh, sales data for a certain number of days. So string days. Yeah. String days, but it's going to be an array, is equal to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And let's declare an array of sales of the same length. Well, I don't know how long this is. Honestly, I do, right? It's seven. But we can do this. Int num days is equal to the size of the days array, size of days, divided by the size of a string. Or we could say divided by the size of the first element, right? Days subscript zero. Same thing, right? If you divide it by the entire length by the bytes occupied by just one element, then you'll get the right number. So when that's done, num day should equal seven. So let's write a loop that'll let us enter that data into sales. We need our variable first. So double sales of num days size. And let's just initialize to zero. Variable must have a constant value. Okay, fine. Const int num underscore size equals seven. I said seven. Now how's about our loop? For int i is equal to zero, keep running while i is less than num size. i plus plus. Let's ask them what day it is. I mean, let's tell them what day it is, right? Enter, a quote, enter data for end quote less than less than days subscript i. So the first day is going to be a Monday when I is zero. The second day is going to be Tuesday. The third day is going to be Wednesday and so on. Let's give them a colon to tell them where to type. And let's read it in. So read in sales into element I, right? CIN greater than, greater than sales. Then we might want to print it out. Well, we can print it with a for loop, right? Or we could print it out as a table where we have the day name followed by the amount. Since these are sales, we would probably want to use the fixed IO manipulator and the precision. So precision and fixed IO manipulator. I know it's misspelled that completely, but Google will fix it for me. Yeah, so setting the precision to 5, we're going to set it to two places. 
so that when we print it out, we see dollars and cents. So let's go add the IO manipulator. Pound side include IO manip. Make a for loop that'll print out our sales arrays. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than num underscore size. Should have called it num days, right? Or number of sales, whatever. I plus plus. Let's set fixed and let's set the precision. Is it set precision or is it just precision? It's just dot precision. Well, we'll find out. It's set precision. Two decimal places. All right. So C out the day name, right? Day subscript I, followed by a space, followed by, well, let's even put a dollar sign there followed by the sales for that particular day. Followed by EMDL. And there we go, right? Enter data for Monday, $10, $20, $30, $40, $30, 20 10 and there we go. Those are our sales. Our little report may have been prettier if we'd printed a header on it, right? Like day, followed by a space, followed by the word sales. And then a backslash in. And on the next line, some dashes to make it look pretty. See out less than less than dash 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 space dash 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 backslash in. Six five four. All right there we go printing a couple of blank lines in front of that would have made it even look make it even prettier right or maybe just some ENDLs same thing right okay does that make sense not sure how many of us are right here let's check We've got, all right, it's you and me. Anyways, is that making sense? What we did there, this is what's known as a parallel array because we have two arrays where the elements are linked by their index number. The sales for day zero are the sales for Monday. The sales for day one are for Tuesday. The sales for day subscript two are for Wednesday. The sales for day subscript three is Thursday and so on. And so we're asking for the input, you know, let user enter the sales. So we display the day name and then we let them store it into the same position in the sales array. So parallel arrays. Sales and days are parallel arrays which are two or more arrays of the same length with the data linked by subscript. In this case, day subscript zero or sales subscript zero, come back here. 
sales subscript zero corresponds with day subscript zero. All right, so if we're going to have some homework based on this idea. Write a program that lets the user enter rainfall for the months of a year. Here's how it should look. Rainfall data entry, right? and then enter the data for Jan and they type in you know 12 or the rainfall not the data and then we're just going to copy this and make it February March and April and May and so on then it's going to print a report The average rainfall was whatever, right? Whatever it came out to. The highest rainfall was 99, and the lowest rainfall was zero, like that. So that's what the report's supposed to be, right? So we let them enter all that data and then we calculate the average and then the highest and then the total. If you want to reprint the array like we were doing here for our sales, you could do that, right? If you want to make a table like we did for our output. Like that, you want to do it like that, that's great, but you don't got to. As long as you're calculating the highest and the lowest and the average, you're good to go. All right, that makes sense. All righty. That's to me. I cannot believe it. I did not record the lecture. Yes, I did. Yes, I did, because I did it on Camtasia. Didn't I? You're going to tell me I did, didn't I? I'm going to cry a river if I did not record it. I know I did. Please tell me I did. Stop recording. Okay, good. I did. <laughs> nice. All right, minutes. All right, so let's go and start. I mean, make a new Dropbox. Oh, I 